Watch out, this video spoils the ending of almost every Metal Gear game in the series because it's made by a fanboy and it might as well stand as a cautionary tale of how being a fanboy could cause you to like things less. But even with that being said, I just want to start us off by saying that the best way to fail as a critic is to suggest that something's perfect without fully explaining why. I have a very complicated mixed opinion about Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, but most mainstream reviewers do not. The game achieved universal critical acclaim, averaging a 93 on Metacritic after a number of maxed out review scores. It was GameSpot's 11th perfect 10 in the site's 19 year history, and after posting a screenshot from a cutscene that wasn't in the game, the review states that when it comes to storytelling, there's never been a Metal Gear game that's so consistent in tone, daring in subject matter, and so captivating in presentation. The game was reviewed by most mainstream critics at a publisher-held review event, referred to as a boot camp, where reviewers had 40 hours to complete the game. There are reports of reviewers at this event using easy modes and ignoring optional content to race to the end of a story as soon as possible in that 40-hour time limit. Despite an expansive open-world design full of optional content that saw many actual customers, myself included, playing over 70, 80, and maybe even 100 hours before seeing this story come to a conclusion. And if you browse any specialized fan forums right now, you'll see opinions vastly differing from those of mainstream reviewers. Outrage over cut content, unfinished story threads, repetitive side missions, and also confusion over a bait-and-switch twist ending that muddies the continuity of the entire series for the sake of directly acknowledging the player's role in it all. And we've been there before. Trying to understand Metal Gear Solid games can be more infuriating than it is rewarding. They meticulously explain a chronology that they also playfully disregard. It's the same conflict between realism versus mysticism, passiveness versus interactivity, and pacifism versus violence that can be found in every game. And this time we have hype, myths, theories, and legends attempting to stack up to reality again. But when it comes to this ending, there are no facts, only interpretations. Much like Metal Gear Solid 2, number 5 ends with a fourth wall break. This time we're not told to turn off the console, but rather given a glimpse at the console. The vintage MSX gaming computer that was home to the original Metal Gear games from the late 80s, while a second big boss explains that we've been playing as a body double this whole time. The implication, starting with the player's own avatar and birthday being input, as well as the weird things the soldiers say on the mother base afterwards, and the whole fact that the body double is just some random unremarkable medic, is all a shout out to any random unremarkable fans who helped the series grow and develop all these years. The message is that anyone can be this legendary action hero. As Big Boss explains it, he is you and you are him. The legend is yours together. The players built it alongside the characters. Big Boss takes your own identity into his. It's a reversal of the Metal Gear Solid 2 situation where Raiden throws away the player's control to become his own character. But this time, the character is now a vector for the player. Venom is almost a silent protagonist, lacking the charisma and charm that we see in even the small glimpses we get of the real boss, who still spouts action movie one-liners without missing a hitch. What, what, what happened to the woman? The woman? I... We gave her a life, she took the short way down. On the other hand, when Venom talks, it's mostly with expected, unimaginative questions or responses that the player themselves are probably asking. And it's all introduced by the reference to David Bowie's Man Who Sold the World, which is commonly explained to be a song about a doppelganger. It's about schizophrenic sensations Bowie experienced when juggling multiple roles during his early career, as the song was made about a year before he began performing as the outlandish character of Ziggy Stardust. Note that the bathroom in this ending is the same room you see anachronistically before the game's title menu. It's just another day in a war without end in outer heaven. The table here, from this camera angle in the introductory cutscene, is full of guns. But when Venom receives this tape explaining his true identity, a time lapse happens when he flips the tape over. You might not have noticed it, but the emblem on the door changes from diamond dogs to outer heaven. The table full of guns in the intro is nowhere to be seen in the ending. Instead, it now has an old computer on it. And the tape is no longer audio, but rather data about Operation Intrude in 313. The events of Metal Gear 1. Venom is using a data cassette reader and the MSX to get ready for what went down in a video game from 1987, and this is the closest thing to the missing link that Metal Gear Solid 5 was promised to deliver. 
It was supposed to be a grandiose, bombastic wrap-up to a 28-year-old series, a story of men becoming demons, a revenge-fueled descent into madness, with one of the most likable video game action heroes becoming an 8-bit pixel villain. But that's not what we got, because as it turns out, we weren't that villain all along. This isn't that story, but really, if you look at the previous games in the series, they easily serve as their own missing link, starting with the moment Big Boss refuses to shake hands at the end of MGS3, to him kidnapping and convincing enemy soldiers to fight for his side in Portable Ops, to that process extending to children in Peace Walker. It gussied it all up with a T rating and a lighthearted tone, but the process of him becoming a charismatic revolutionary future war criminal are already established by Ground Zeroes, in which the background narrative sees him hiding evidence of nuclear weapons before an inspection. His stated purpose is nuclear deterrence, though the story of Peace Walker seems to suggest that deterrence theory is a farce. This all happens after he misremembers how his fight with the boss went down, while also singing a lot of hypocritical purple poetry about creating an army without borders, even though they clearly have their own territorial waters, their own anthem, their own currency, and certainly their own sense of identity that they get defensive about, all the while profiting off of small conflicts happening around the world. For all intents and purposes, he is creating a nation with an army. The main difference with his concept is that the nation is the army. The big boss we see in Metal Gear 1 barely has any writing to him at all. From a game in 1987 where technological limits and the standards of the time didn't require deep characterization. And as it turns out, a twist from 28 years later tells us that that big boss was just a body double. But three years later in Metal Gear 2, we defeat a thoroughly evil, warmongering big boss whose downfall really should not come as any surprise based on what you've been doing in those games. And as it turns out, that one was the real deal. The prequel games might not have felt like a villain's origin story, because you were seeing it from his perspective, and no one believes themselves to be the bad guy. After Venom flips the tape, ten years pass. The official name of Outer Heaven is finally adopted, and Venom's horn grows much, much bigger. A reference to the game's invisible karma system that makes your horn grow bigger as you kill more enemies. Venom evidently kills a lot of people in those ten years. And as he's becoming more demonic, there's also collaboration between him and the real boss. It's unclear when Venom receives the Man Who Sold the World tape, but when he does, he smirks at hearing the news. He smashes the mirror image of his future self, covered in blood with a big horn, and walks back into the fog of the previous ten years. But that future will come to him, despite the fact that Venom is actually the lesser of two evils. In Peace Walker, Chico and Paz are child soldiers that actually are part of your base management spreadsheets, and to be fair, Paz is not actually a child, but Big Boss and the MSF administration don't know that at the time. Also in Peace Walker, developing a nuke is mandatory to get the true ending. But in Phantom Pain, child soldiers are rescued and kept far away from battle, and assembling nukes is entirely optional and discouraged, since it gives you a boatload of those negative karma points. Instead, stealing other nukes and disabling them is what's required to unlock yet another ending. And when you consider this series as anti-nuke politics, then that should easily leave Venom standing as the more morally righteous version of Big Boss. This cutscene is said to trigger once a currently unconfirmed quota of FOB nukes are decommissioned. Good luck doing that, though, because the online system rarely allows that to happen. I have to drive out this demon inside me. Build a better future. That's what I... What we... will leave as our legacy. Another mission, right, boss? The two bosses, despite their differences, are not in conflict with one another. Venom knows his true identity, yet he is ready for another mission. And eventually, that other mission comes. If one big boss is infiltrated into America's special forces to command Foxhound, and another is keeping the dream alive at Outer Heaven, then the one at Foxhound is going to need to maintain his cover by conducting operations against Outer Heaven, but only with weak suicide missions that wouldn't do serious damage, like sending in a lone and experienced rookie that neither expects to actually succeed. Which is exactly the setup for Metal Gear 1, and this twist reframes the entire series' continuity as being less about the beginning and end of nuclear deterrence or the Cold War, or even the life and death of Big Boss, but rather about the starting point of his whole arc. It's about the beginning and ending of people misinterpreting the boss's will, retroactively rewriting the final boss battle of MG1 to mirror the trigger of Big Boss's own downfall, with him stealing and reshaping the identity of one of his men and then exploiting that man's loyalty to take the fall in a fight against a protege. Just like the story of MGS3. 
It reframes the whole 28-year continuity as being one big story about how no one expected the recessive genetic clone of Big Boss to shatter the Patriots and the conspirators behind them, all the while splintering away from the US by forming his own NGO, Philanthropy, which is basically just him and Otacon doing what they want on their own terms. Solid realizes the boss's will without knowing it and without creating any corrupt world-controlling conspiracies of his own. Compare that to the series-spanning schemes of the prequel game and you can begin to see why the 1984 references come into play. Big Boss is similar to 1984's Big Brother, controlling populations by being a charismatic cult of personality that fuels a series of never-ending small conflicts. Zero's Cypher, and later the Patriots, are analogous to 1984's Ingsoc. They're an artificial ideology that controls populations through manipulation of information and language. And both of these conspiracies come to pass, as the themes of MGS4 and MGS2 are respectively explored via the war economy and the Patriots. And we see these conspiracies begin to be put into action in MGS5's own version of the year of 1984. And all of that is why, after a few days of thinking on it, I came to terms with this twist. It actually helped reverse my opinion of some of these games that I've never been a fan of. If you've ever wondered why it's been so much harder for me to drum up the enthusiasm to make a serious video about any Metal Gear games after 3, it's because the plot in all of them hinges on what looks like a contrivance made for the sake of convenience. There's also a good dose of self-hatred running underneath 4, but it's mostly the inexplicable heel turn made by MGS3's radio cast that really turned me off from this franchise for a while. For the longest time, the question of who are the Patriots was burning with so much implausibility that the answer could never be more satisfying than whatever the guesses were. And that was kind of the point. And then 4 comes along and tells us that the original Patriots were the comic relief. The cockney British James Bond fan, the Godzilla fan, the greatest soldier in the world who eats mushrooms to recharge his batteries, and a Russian cowboy who meows like a cat, and the, the token black guy who might have been the only sane person in the group. Giving a stupid answer to a stupid question was the cherry on top of the failed conclusion that was MGS4. And as silly as it was, it's, it's still an indulgent spectacle. I've always been more interested in seeing how Kojima can explain away that one, rather than Big Boss. And in 5, we finally get a glimpse of that explanation, from Zero's truth tapes. We finally get to hear that cockney, likable James Bond fan not be the nefarious villain he was bewilderingly slated to be, but rather letting his own convoluted plans go out of control. It kind of makes Big Boss's appearance and speech about the guy at the end of 4 make way more sense than it did back then. Zero's obsession over spying, secrecy, and overly complicated underground schemes eventually get the better of him. If Big Boss is an analog for the player, then Zero is an analog for Kojima, and his plans are blowing up on him yet again, where overambitious goals couldn't be realized in time and the purported series finale feels like it's wrapping things up one game too early, released one year too early, despite trying his hardest and having the best of intentions. The twist is the closest this series has come to being like Metal Gear Solid 2, and while I think I get it and I want to appreciate the twist, somehow I feel like it's not going to get the kind of delayed appreciation MGS2 eventually got. Reason number one is because of the presentation of it all. Because the twist happens for literally no reason. You get Mission 46 in your main ops list after filling a quota of side ops and base upgrades that just make it suddenly appear in this abstract magical video game menu. There's no justification behind why Venom would suddenly remember the hospital escape differently. There's no word when, where, how, or why that revelation happens. And as well written and performed and satisfying as Zero's truth tapes are, their very existence just highlights how disassociated this game's story is with its own interface. You can break the whole drama up with the simple question of, Who's holding the microphone? Who's recording conversations of the most secretive man in the world, and how did they get into Venom's Walkman? We'll never know, because the most pivotal moments in this game's plot happen completely outside of its plot, hours after it wraps up for no reason. The twist is also something we all saw coming. It's obvious from the start, once you hear Ishmael delivering Kiefer's voice. It was even hinted at years ago in the GDC reveal trailer. A fan theory about the medic being a double of Big Boss appeared almost as soon as Ground Zeroes was released when fans heard Kiefer coming from not just Venom or Ishmael, but also the medic. And those who already knew the David Bowie song had yet another reason to see this game's greatest revelation happen minutes after the game even begins. 
The twist also doesn't really hit hard because the game's not thoroughly written to lead up to it. The very, very beginning is, and some minor hints are strewn throughout the first few missions, but compare that to the entirety of Metal Gear Solid 2's game, where the pacing, the character design, the boss battles, and even the level layouts were all meticulously designed to lead up to that moment where you hear you're in a Solid Snake simulation. And without that dedication to seeing the twist through, I have to wonder what purpose MGS5's twist really serves to its story when the prospect of just enjoying the story for what it is is hard to do in the first place. It's mostly a predictable plot that feels awkwardly skimpier than the padded game length. It's about a villain who's up to no good and a hero who has to stop him with a mystical sidekick who helps him out, and there's so few twists and turns along the way that I was sure it wasn't over when it tried to trick me into thinking it was over. I knew it wasn't over, because there was no climax, no prison escape sequence, no racing any vehicles to a countdown timer, no button mashing torture sequences, not even any real plot twists. No friends become enemies, there's no sympathetic side to the villain, no fourth wall breaking ghosts. When chapter one was over, I knew it wasn't over. And when chapter two was over, I couldn't believe it actually really was over. It was a feeling of disbelief and emptiness, a feeling for what should be there, but what's not. What's not there is personality and energy. You're not playing as the charismatic big boss, you're playing a confused, brainwashed body double. You play as someone who spends cutscenes with a thousand yard stare, never seeming to know what to say. Dialogue is written in simple sentences that are prolonged with awkward, loaded silences. Don't think the infection's airborne, but... Find the source of that transmission, boss. Find our man. You never know. In making a vector for the player's own version of Big Boss's legend, Venom is ironically less of a fun character, much like the returning cast as well. We don't get to know how Ocelot and Snake became friends, which would seem to be important considering how hard they're trying to kill each other before these events, and Ocelot himself is also bizarrely underused as a character. This guy is a complete and total oddball, both before and after this game's events, but in this one he's a flat, monotone encyclopedia, and there's no twist behind that, no clever writing explaining it. His personality is just missing. Just like a coherent sense of pacing and direction. Quality has never been a problem for the Metal Gear Solid series until now, where a two-minute song sequence is used to kill time during a car ride. The closest analogy is The Ladder from MGS3, which served as a tone-changing intermission. But the song in MGS5 is an interruption. It stops a one-sided conversation that resumes immediately after the song's over. What's also missing were surprises. Even without the visibly cut content of episode 51, there's not a lot happening here that you didn't see in even the early trailers. The story's attempting to stretch out anywhere from 40 to 100 hours of gameplay, but a lot of that story can already be seen after watching 15 minutes of trailers. Kojima has endured criticism for the length of his cutscenes for over 15 years, but in this case it just feels like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Going from too much to too little skips the happy medium in between. It hurts, because for the first time, this is a Metal Gear game where what we saw was mostly what we got. There's little character development and really little story to uncover, but everything would suggest otherwise. One random door, one of many, hides a major game-changing subplot behind it. This led to me spending hours searching Mother Base for something else interesting, and it was something that wasn't there, with nothing but the nostalgic sounds of synthed-up 80s hits in the background. It would be beautiful if it wasn't so sad and so time-consuming. Speaking of music, even the game's orchestral score is missing something. I noticed this after replaying Ground Zero shortly afterwards. It's missing the emotional punch of Harry Gregson Williams, who did the music for Ground Zeroes but only got a production credit in Phantom Pain. And the score is fine, it's as great, it's okay, it's just missing the extra little notch that put the other games past that threshold into excellence. What we saw from the trailers may have been what we got, but what we were told, with words in the trailers and also through Kojima's marketing and Twitter channels, was not what we got at all. Words can kill and language can be manipulated, and we were promised a return to Camp Omega which didn't happen. A major planned feature was just missing in action. 
we were promised to feel ashamed of our words and deeds regarding quiet, silly costume, and that sure doesn't happen. So let's get this out of the way. I've never cared about the costume. I don't think putting a video game character in a bikini is that much of a damnable offense. But as it turns out, the costume was just the tip of this fan service iceberg. L l look at that, she she's coming like 12 inches away from, from making butthole to camera contact, and, and this happens multiple times. Even by Metal Gear standards, that's a little much. Quiet shoving her butthole into the camera is not a problem of her character flaunting her character's sexuality, because her character's role in the story has nothing to do with sex. This costume has nothing to do with sex. Considering the events of the entire story and her arc from beginning to end, she has no reason to be flaunting herself. The real reason she does is because sex and controversy sell games better than well-written characters do, and the story of this one had to suffer for that because of a piss-poor justification behind why she has to and needs to be wearing almost nothing. And it just shows how far downhill Kojima's writing standards have gone since the third game, which also stands as an example of how to literally shove boobs in the camera in a way that actually has some reason to be there. If written well, there doesn't have to be anything shameful about this. Quiet comes the closest to having a complete character arc out of the whole cast, and then finally, after like 80 hours, she finally bursts out of captivity and gets a moment of badassery that's all her own, but I couldn't stop thinking about how dumb the scene with the shower was, and that sure does ruin the mood. And then the game ends. Ava's scenes had her wearing even less, but it was expressly because she wanted to bone Snake, both for the fun of it and for the sake of her mission, and then just look at him, wouldn't you? What I'm trying to say is that it's way easier to get caught up in the relatable drama of sexual tension between two thoroughly cool individuals who want to crawl all over each other so bad but they can't because they're on the clock, versus the alien sci-fi drama of one cool individual wanting to put on clothes but she can't because her lungs are burnt so she uses nanomachines, I mean parasites, to breathe through her skin. And that also folds in to another thing that was promised but not delivered. And that is some kind of morality-shaking taboo that could cause Kojima to leave the industry if he messes it up. There are child soldiers, that's shocking, but they're treated as a kind of Neverland Lord of the Flies situation, with them being a separate faction from the adults who only really get up to trouble once the adults aren't around. The game instantly fails if an ounce of harm comes to them, and during the scene where Snake heroically leads a band of war orphans away from danger, the story is putting him on such a high pedestal that him becoming a demon is already looking like a distant proposition. In all fairness, the tweets about the taboos were from 2010. They were likely about the content on Ground Zeroes, which was far more extreme, but with all the trailers hinting that the child soldiers were connected to Snake's downfall, I was, yet again, feeling around for some kind of shock value that was not there. And the weirdest thing is that that makes sense. By casting a new, more heroic version of Big Boss, Kojima also casted the player's contribution to Big Boss's legend. In an ode to player involvement, we have the most interactive and finely tuned gameplay across the whole series, with a switch to more streamlined Far Cry controls and HUD, with stealth mechanics so refined that anything Ubisoft churns out will probably never hope to stack up to this. The closest thing it feels like to me is actually Hitman, with each mission beginning a clockwork of AI scripts that the player can throw a wrench into at any moment. And despite making a heavy departure towards the slower animation and less abstraction of western-style action games, it still retains the fast, highly controllable, and borderline slapstick comedy playstyle that is how this series has always done stealth. Playing with tactics that might as well have been easter eggs in previous games feels just as fully thought out and convincingly animated as a more traditional run. So while the story is so lukewarm, there's simply a lot to love once your hands are on the controller. If Kojima's standards for writing have gone this far downhill since 3, it's amazing to see the non-linearity and open-ended design of 3 only improve over time. I could spend an hour just playing around with how many different ways there were to enter and exit one section of Groznygrad, but in this game, I found myself spending three hours experimenting with the routes in and out of a tiny little barracks base at the very beginning of the game. But really, I was experimenting with guard reactions and timings, chasing so hard after those S ranks because the scoring system had me dynamically choosing my own difficulty level without me even knowing it. 
Foltoning living, breathing guards out of a combat zone is a great way to incentivize non-lethal high-level play that doesn't feel like a shoehorned reward. Instead, putting in more effort smoothly and dynamically gives you more of a payout. When MGS4 gave players a third-person shooter control style, there was little reason to play it like a stealth game by the time the final chapters roll around. But in 5, sneaking in and out of a base, stealing everything they don't have nailed down, and making sure everyone's none the wiser is more than just a cool sticker on a scoring screen. It's a long-term investment, rewarding you extra money and manpower that unlocks more of the game faster, with enough of a sheer volume of unlocks to make faster unlocking worthwhile, even if you waste a whole lot of time getting to the end of the story. It's a system that openly acknowledges and rewards that silly no-trank non-lethal European extreme run I was doing with 3 last year, with enough hidden objectives and unlockables that make me really want to come back and do it all over again. But unlike the other games in the series, I just don't know if I have the time for a lot of replays with this one. There's a truly insane amount of attention put into how it plays, which drips right into all the concessions they had to make for fitting this into an open world. That's why there's reflex mode, and why guards won't ever see you driving towards them in broad daylight, and why collectible flowers are found in diverse clusters near helicopter drop-off points which shows a great dedication to keeping the gameplay fun and flowing, but it's important to know that these are attempts at compromising for a more scattershot level design. Guards are already slower to investigate sightings than past games, and reflex mode especially would have made the previous games too easy, but in this one there's such a sheer volume of both sight lines and experimental tactics to worm your way out of them that it works as both a smooth balancing force and yet another tool for the player to exploit. And putting flowers near helicopter drop-off points is great, it gives players Players something to do while waiting for the helicopter, because they knew players would be waiting a whole lot for the helicopter. And after 110 hours, I sure did get tired of waiting for that helicopter. Even with the insane amount of attention poured into making the core gameplay satisfying, I, I was still wondering if I was playing the same game as these reviewers. Glaring flaws still exist here, but it got universal acclaim. Like, uh, wh why is the fast travel system so bad? Side ops unlock in tiers of about three or four at a time, and they're usually placed at opposite ends of these huge maps. And without anything interesting to do on your way to them, you really need a fast travel system that is just not there. I actually measured how long it takes to call a helicopter down, get on it, and then ride to another part of the map. And this is after getting the advanced helicopter unlocks in the end game. I measured 3 minutes, 10 seconds, and, and that, that just should not be acceptable. You can cheese out of about half of that by going to the AAC through your pause menu, but even chopping that time in half leaves you with about 70 seconds longer than this process should reasonably take. Why, why can't you just press a button to skip the animation if the helicopter's going through a safe area? That's, that's it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. I had my hopes up that the cardboard box shipments would fill this gap, but they're placed so sparsely and under such heavy guard that they don't do the job either. Side ops have you generally doing one objective, go to a point on the map and make a quota of things go away. There's no diversity to your objectives. Sometimes you make a tank go away, sometimes individual soldiers, very rarely containers, but it's always the same kind of goal. And as you figure out effective strategies, that means the same kind of gameplay. And that very same problem is plaguing the main ops, whose objectives boil down to two broad categories. Either go from A to B, or make things A to B disappear and then escape the hot zone, with bosses usually falling into category two. The extra objectives show a wealth of creative problems to solve, and hell, even Ground Zeroes did too with its little audio analysis puzzle, but as far as the main ops in Phantom Pain go, it's either move from A to B, steal thing A to B, or defeat the boss. For all the different creative ways there are to play these missions, the missions themselves follow a very restrictive and limited formula. You do the same thing so many times across such a long time with such little story development occurring per hour that it's impossible not to have some kind of serious pacing problem happen to that story. It's about 12 hours of good missions and good scenes stretched out to 112 hours. And yet, I can go on the game's radar review and read about side ops that are non-essential but highly worthwhile, or the Jimquisition one that managed to avoid the review event entirely but still says it's densely packed but not padded with filler content, and meanwhile I'm spending seven minutes driving to destroy the tank unit number eight after destroy the heavy infantry number eight, taking them off of a literal checklist, and I I'm just thinking in response to these reviews, I I'm just like, what? 
it, it's it's fine. It's it's okay. It's still a good game, and I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't giggle my ass off when making this stupid horse boy logo and prancing around the jungle in leopard print chaps, pretending to be one of the ball fondlers. That, that that's that's great. I'm in heaven right now. This might be the best day of my life. But so many sandbox games get bloated up with unnecessary filler content, and that just comes with the territory. But between the problems that causes, as well as the need to go through repetitive and thoughtless side ops, the lack of a real fast travel system, a stilted online mode that gives an in for microtransactions, and the way your radio messages talk over your cassette tapes, and the bullet sponge skulls bosses that have no weak points or stealthy strategies to counter them, which are half the boss fights in the game, and the most glaring flaw, a shamefully butchered chapter 2 of conspicuously cut content and replayed missions leaves me absolutely boggled by the naive positivity of these reviews. Am I just crazy? Is my opinion that far off the mainstream? I, I still don't get it. I, I get that I'm a huge fanboy and that the huge amount I care about the stupid plot questions are just something that doesn't matter to anyone and that that's just fine, that's whatever, but even if those reviews are just based on the technical merits of its gameplay alone, they still seem weird. As good as the gameplay here is, it still has real, tangible problems that need to be addressed with criticism. Problems that amount to a game that's not a 10 on 10 masterpiece of the medium that sees Kojima stepping off of a venerated pedestal. The series he's made has grown into a self-contradicting mess. Every new installment is an excuse to keep a 28-year-old story going, and those excuses look more far-fetched as it goes on. And without more balanced criticism, that is what becomes praised as the gold standard for any kind of artist looking to span a story over a long series. These reviews were based on 40 hours spent at a publisher-held review event paid for and conducted by Konami. My review was based on over 110 hours spent in my house after spending my own $60. And I, I get this game's purpose, I get its aim, and can appreciate the effort it made, but it's a weak, exhausted punch to end this prolonged series with the greatest and biggest Metal Gear game ever. It's an honest attempt that in no way could possibly hit as hard as it wants to, or satisfy everyone it wants to. The energy and enthusiasm has been long gone, but the sheer man-hours and resources they put into this are staggering. While the core act of sneaking past nearsighted guards has never felt better, almost everything that happens in between either takes too long or just misses that same mark. The story is all over the place, a literal reading about vocal cord parasites and a self-sacrificing sniper, even if you included the cut episode 51, would still fail to reach the deliberate pacing and careful characterization of past games. And a metaphorical reading about that story, about a decoy boss reifying all the player's heroics, still misses the biting confrontational tone of when MGS2 slowly bottled the tension up to the same revelation. What's left comes out of nowhere, and the message feels, right now, two weeks after launch, kind of patronizing. You're big boss! Good job, buddy! You did good! Here's a, here's a gold star! In the art section of the Collector's Edition Strategy Guide, Kojima says that Skullface's absence fairly early on in the game will leave players with a lasting phantom pain. And the game sure does do that. But it only feels intentional in three places. First, with its big action movie arc involving Skullface and his parasites ending too soon. Second, with Quiet leaving your team forever despite feeling like an essential part of it. And third, with the conclusion of Paz's substory. Collecting photos for her gives you something to do through the whole game. It's some hope of greater developments eventually coming before you realize that it was all a figment of Venom's imagination. But remember that Venom is the medic. This hallucination of Paz is him trying to will away the guilt of not finding the second bomb. It's a subtle and understated layer to a story that climaxes with horrific body horror and genuine sadness. It's a real Silent Hill quality moment that just made me sad that Kojima's Silent Hill got cancelled. Kojima was aiming to break some kind of taboo that would have been so intense that it could cause him to leave the industry. And despite that, I can't really put my finger on what it might have been here unless it was the literal phantom pain felt by the player. It would be if Kojima had deliberately, with all intents and purposes, aimed to make an experience that could satisfy mainstream audiences while leaving more hardcore fans feeling for something that wasn't there. At this point in time, it is too easy to chalk up anything underwhelming he does as some kind of fourth wall breaking masterful ruse. But between the quotes, the misleading words on the trailers, and the misdirection from his own interviews and tweets, it's also hard to let that explanation go. 
The phantom pain on the box does indeed reference a feeling that lots of fans are experiencing right now. The problem for looking at this game in the future is going to be figuring out how much of that was intended versus how much of it was an unfortunate accident.